Okay, um, welcome for those um, who are here today to hear about the Connecting the Calm Nature Credits project, um, but also welcome to those who are listening or watching the recording at home in your own time when it suits you better. Um, this is a rerun basically of a workshop we have already done with 15 farmers who are taking part. And um, this is for the sort of remaining five farms in the group who are interested in taking part in the project just to find out um, what it is all about and what the next steps are. Um, so the main question of this project is basically how can we create a nature credit market for the calm? So I'm going to give you a bit of a background of what the project is about and then delve into some of the details of nature credit markets and how they work and then how we could make it work for the calm to basically provide some environmental benefits but also give some income to farmers who are carrying out the work. So yeah, the overarching project aim is to evaluate the potential for a natural capital market in the calm catchment. Um, and the next three points are what we want such a capital market to deliver. Um, the main aim is to deliver nature outcomes in terms of reduced flood risk, carbon and biodiversity but it also needs to provide fair compensation and income for farmers. Um, as you all know, the current um, countryside stewardship schemes or sustainable farming incentive are mainly based on income foregone. So basically just compensating farmers for the cost of carrying out certain activities on their land. Um, whereas we are hoping to get to a stage with this credit market so that we can provide compensation, but also income for farmers to make it worth taking part in this. Um, and we also want to provide reliable impacts for investors, because at the end of the day, this is what investors or buyers are paying for. Um, they're usually paying for offsetting something, and so they need to know that what they are paying for is actually happening on the ground. So just some quick basics of how these credit markets work. Um, this is very, very simplified um, and there's very, very complicated markets out there. But I think as a starter, I'm gonna keep it simple. Um, so the very, very basic um, idea is that a farmer um, does something on the land um, that provides an environmental benefit that environmental benefit is then um, turned into a credit and a buyer pays for the credit, which basically gives the farmer compensation and income for what the farmer is doing. Um, generally, um, nature credit markets are looking for environmental betterment. So there's no opportunity for payments for things that are already being done. So let's say a farm has a woodland that is already storing carbon. Um, that can't be paid through a current, through a nature credit scheme because we are looking for environmental betterment. So for let's say carbon, we need to store, well, we need to use less carbon overall, but we also need to store more carbon um, in woodlands, for example. So that's what a betterment would pay for, but not an existing woodland. Um, generally, different credits for, let's say, um, biodiversity, flooding, or nutrient management, or whatever, can be stacked and blended so that you can ideally get income for the same thing through several different income streams, although that then depends on what scheme you are entering and I'll talk about that in a bit as well. Um, generally our advice especially in terms of carbon is that it's important to do a carbon audit on your farm and get carbon neutral first before selling off any carbon credits. Um, all farms will be required to become carbon neutral by 2050 so it's important to know how much you would need to do in order to get there and then carry out those 
and register them so that you can, you know, officially claim then I am carbon neutral. Um, because if you are selling credits now, and then at a later stage, you find that actually you're not carbon neutral first, and you need to carry out work to, to become carbon neutral, you might not have enough land available to do this. And then you might have to sell carbon credits for this to be delivered elsewhere. Um, so getting a little bit more complicated, um, ideally, um, buyers want to deal with as little farmers as possible and deliver as much as possible, you know, across a large area, for example. So generally nature credit markets work not as a direct contract between a farmer and a buyer, but farmers sort of group together and have an intermediary, which for the calm, for example, could be the calm marketplace. Um, a separate entity that sort of aggregates what farmers can do and has in increased power to negotiate with buyers, has more to offer because it's aggregated what farmers in a certain area or the calm catchment can do. This intermediary then negotiates with buyers, sets up contracts, and also <coughs> There's a, a, a sort of third or fourth party, if you like, which is um, getting grants and investors in for some upfront cost. So let's say we have a buyer who wants to pay for flood risk reduction. Usually they want to start paying at a stage when they are actually receiving some of the benefits, which usually takes a bit of time um, from you know starting a credit scheme until all the different structures have been carried out on farms. So they might not want to be paying from, from the start. So therefore you could get some gra existing grants, um, but also some investors in to um, say, we'll cover some of the upfront costs. Later on, the buyer will start paying and the intermediary then can get the money from the buyers, pay to the farmers what the farmers are due to be paid, and also start paying back some of the investors' money um, that was put in up front, obviously, with usually with some interest for the investors to make money. So we can see how very, very quickly this gets very complicated. Um, and there's a long, long process involved in setting up these sorts of schemes. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just sort of talk you through and talk you through what FWAG or the AONB have done so far under this project um, to basically figure out whether, you know, there is opportunity to set up a nature credit scheme and what that is and how it could look like, how it could work. So usually there is the first step is some initial project scoping, which the AONB has done by setting up the project. They've secured, um, you know, upfront funding through the um, connecting the Calm project. So that's come from several sources, but the one that we're working on now is the um, Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund. Um, and they have also talked um, talked to Network Rail already, who have an interest in reducing flood risk, which I get to um, in the next slide and have paid for modeling to be done in order to um, map out where the flood risk is highest and where interventions could best be placed in order to achieve flood risk reduction. The next step then is to engage, well, to identify and work with the sellers. So the sellers in, in this project are um, the farmers, um, as I said earlier, we've already had an initial meeting with 15 farmers, and this presentation is for the um, next five farmers to sort of get up to speed with what has happened so far. The next step then is to look at baseline data and estimate how much certain activities um, could deliver in terms of environmental benefit. So FWAG has done a lot of baseline mapping and mapping of opportunities. Um, 
which we will send well some of it i will show you here and some of it we will send you um for your review in a few weeks time um then the next step would be to identify and work with buyers so we've got a project partner called terranomics um who have already started the conversation with the likes of network rail but also the council um investment banks and so on to see what the appetite is for potentially investing or buying credits um, within the catchment. Um, so then there's the sort of next part of a project, which is then um, working out what the business case and the financial model could be, um, which gets even trickier because that means calculating um, how much funding would be required for individual actions to be carried out um, in order to make sure that the funding compensates for the cost and the income foregone that farmers incur, but also provides an income in order to encourage farmers to take part, basically. Um, so this one we have started doing. I will show you some of our... Um, ways of we have tried to work this out, but also we will further engage with you in a few weeks time on those to get your input. Um, then a credit scheme needs to develop a governance structure. So again, we will gather your opinion and Terranomics will gather buyer's opinion. And then we have to get together and see whether those match up and whether it is possible um, to set up a scheme. Um, so yeah, for those for this and for the payment rates, we will send you a survey once we have mapped all of the opportunities on your land um, to sort of suggest, you know, this this is what our baseline mapping and modeling suggests would be the best place to carry out a certain action. We have calculated how much it is costing you to carry out this action, how much income you are losing through that and then we're asking you know do you agree with those figures have we missed something what would you need to be paid on top in order to be encouraged to carry out this action and it is valid in this case to ask for you know essentially to ask to be paid a profit on what you're doing because you know if a buyer has to pay more than just income foregone and compensation, but therefore they get something to actually be completed that will help them. That is their incentive to pay more than maybe they would otherwise want to pay. And then once we have all of that information and we have worked out whether there is scope in, you know, matching up the needs of everyone who wants to be involved, um, Terranomics can make proposals to buyers and we can try and develop this model a lot further. So you can see how complex all of this is, but you can also see that your input is absolutely crucial to this project. So in a way, WAG is, is mainly working with you in order to get your opinion and input because these schemes can only work if they are laid out in a way that make you want to take part otherwise nothing gets delivered and therefore there's no need for buyers to buy anything because there's nothing to be bought in a, in a way so just to go through a few examples of um, nature credit schemes to give you an idea of what is currently out there and what a calm scheme could potentially look like and we're we are obviously looking at trying to stack together different schemes so if we are asking you or, you know, if you say I can carry out a certain action, um, you would say, yeah, you can say I would carry out this action and then we can work out there's existing funding for that, which is this much, but you would need to be paid this much in order to do it. So what is the funding gap? And then ask the buyer to fill that funding gap. 
So some of that fun, existing funding would come from regulated nature credit schemes that are already out there. Um, one of those is called Biodiversity Net Gain. It's mandatory for developers from November 2023. So it's already working, but it's a voluntary scheme at the moment, but soon will be mandatory and we'll work through the planning process. Um, so the aim is to replace and increase habitat lost by development, um, but also to increase it by 10%. So let's say a developer is building houses <clears throat> and that is replacing species rich grassland that developer then has to either um, create such a habitat plus 10 percent of the area on their own land or by credits to replace and increase that habitat elsewhere so this can't be stacked with carbon or any other credits um, basically because it's a legal requirement for someone to carry this out and therefore it can then also be funded through um, public funding or other funding. There's the Woodland Carbon Code and the Peatland Carbon Code. So under the Woodland Carbon Code you can get funding for creating new woodland which has um, capital upfront payments and then you can register the carbon that you are sequestering through the planted woodland under this woodland carbon code. And that then generates how many credits you are doing, which is basically one ton of carbon stored is a credit. And then companies from the UK or abroad can buy these credits. And the idea with these credits is that the credit value will rise in the future as the demand for offsetting through credit schemes increases. So just to give you a quick example, um, organizations like FWAG <clears throat> will be required from in two years time or something to have a strategy in place to become carbon neutral as well, just like farmers have to do it. WAG will have to do it if WAG wants to be a contractor on any government project or receive any government funding. So you can you can think about how many companies will be involved in anything to do with government delivery. And that will tell you straight away that the demand for those schemes will go up massively, whilst the land for delivering schemes like this is obviously limited to how much land there is and how much farmers are willing to deliver. Um, so therefore, those credits will become more and more expensive. Um, then there is private sort of bespoke schemes, which is probably a bit more like something that we are looking for creating in the calm catchment. So this is an example of the River Y natural flood management project. Um, so this one was set up by the Rivers Trust. And basically what they did was um, they had United Utilities and um, the council who were interested in flood risk reduction. So they got some hydrological modeling done, a bit like we have done in the catchment um, to sort of identify, well, how much could, how much betterment could be achieved and where would that take place? Um, they then engage land managers, landowners, who are basically the suppliers of um, nature credits, which here are the flood risk reduction credits. And then they formed a Y catchment community interest company to sort of aggregate what can be delivered in the catchment and negotiate with all the other partners involved and also hold the funds, pay out the funding to farmers and basically be that one point of contact for several investors and buyers. Um, they then achieved some upfront um, grants and investments. Um, the grants came from the Woodland Trust and DEFRA for tree planting and carrying out capital works. And investors were, there were some private investors, but also Triodos Bank, who, and, essentially loaned 
um, upfront costs, which are then being repaid later on. And the, the buyers are the beneficiaries in the catchment who will benefit from flood risk. So that's United Utilities, Environment Agency and the council, but also some private properties that are at risk of flooding. Um, so they, for six years, those beneficiaries are essentially leasing land from the landowners. And from year six, they are then also paying um, based on outcomes to the farmers. Um, and through then those, those payments that are being paid back over nine years, that gives enough income for the community interest company to pay the farmers, but also pay back the investments that they received up front. And they have, they have a governance structure as well to kind of oversee it all and um, provide advice. And the, the advisors, which is the Rivers Trust, are also verifying the outcomes. So let's say the farmer um, creates woodland or constructs a pond, um, the River Trust then goes and visits those sites um, at intervals that were agreed, I don't know what they are, to, to monitor whether the outcomes were achieved and are still being achieved so that, you know, then the outcome-based payments are released from the buyers and there is some verification process. So what has the project achieved? Um, across the catchment, they have um, created 39 hectares of woodland, um, 1,710 leaky dams, which are um, woody dams that are placed in little streams up to large rivers that basically slow the flow of water going through and spread high flood waters onto the floodplain to hold it back temporarily and then slowly release it again um, down the catchment. 42 ponds um, that are temporarily holding back flood water either on the floodplain or sort of runoff ponds across the catchment and they have planted 10 kilometers of hedges on buns which basically are across slopes to hold back water but also have increased infiltration of that water into the soil. And the modeling basically showed that carrying out these interventions would have a 10% reduction in flood impact, which is the basis on which the payments were set and negotiated with the buyers. So something quite similar could be the case in the calm catchment. Um, but obviously this project is sort of trying to work out how all of this could be done. Um, yeah. So I've showed you this before, but basically I'm gonna talk you through the individual steps that we have already delivered and that we will still deliver with you. Um, and the first part is what the AONB has done to set up the project. So as part of initial project scoping, um, the ANB has looked, well, talked to um, Network Rail because the railway line at Station Road has flooded 13 times since 2008, which is costing Network Rail um, more, well, more than is feasible um, for just building a bridge. So more needs to be done than just some infrastructure for them to solve the problem. Um, so the AONB has commissioned hydrological modeling to look at the whole catchment upstream and identify, you know, what, what could something be done across the whole catchment to ease that flood risk um, in that place. And therefore, that then would be the baseline information on which Network Rail could pay landowners to deliver something that, that is of benefit to them. Um, so their outputs essentially look a little bit like this. They looked at nature-based solutions, um, which can reduce flood risk, um, which includes anything like um, woodland creation, floodplain reconnection, 
leaky woody dams and a really large um, factor is soil improvements. So soil improvements is looking at increasing the infiltration of rainwater into soils so that the rainwater doesn't instantly or quickly run off into streams and that basically slows the whole response of flooding from rainfall events. So these are the, the sort of main actions or nature-based solutions they have identified and have then modeled. And across the catchment, there's a lot of interventions that they have mapped. So through the modeling, they have found that lots of small interventions in the catchment can achieve a 16 to 21% flood peak reduction um, and also a delay in the, you know, the flood peak arriving at the um, network rail crossing and also a reduction in the flooding duration. So this graph shows, um, this is time down here and then a monitored flow at, at the crossing point. So what happens after rainfall, we get the flow going up and then it's it's slowly going down again. So um, this is the current situation. The red is, is responding very quickly and then going down again. Whereas um, with interventions, we are then in the sort of black line scenarios where you can see the flood peak, flood peak is a lot lower and it's also delayed and the time at which there is overtopping is much less, which is, you know, narrower on the graph. So essentially, the modeling has shown that there is scope to solve the issue by doing lots of little interventions in the catchment, which for network rail are hopefully cheaper than doing massive investments on infrastructure. Plus, in terms of looking at long term resilience, it probably there probably needs to be done a bit of both because not only are we talking about issues we already have, but with climate change and um, increased rainfall or rainfall intensity, we might be facing larger problems than we currently have. Okay, so um, this table shows you all the different nature-based solutions um, that were included in the model, but which we are also including at looking for other nature credits which aren't just linked to um, flooding. So on the left, you've got all sorts of different interventions and on the right, I'm showing whether they are helpful with flood risk reduction, carbon sequestration or biodiversity. And the, the more excess there are, the, the more benefit a measure provides. And we've also indicated how much of the land put under this nature-based solution would be lost to agricultural production, just to give you an idea of how involved an action is. So the first sort of grouping of nature-based solutions is all about tree planting, riparian woodlands, catchment woodlands. Um, those are obviously not, not used for um, agricultural production anymore, although some catchment woodlands um, can provide shelter, so therefore we've reduced it slightly and it's 90% of the land is lost because there is some benefit um, for agriculture. But woodlands create um, high um, benefits for all of the three nature benefits that we're looking for. Then there is um, integration of trees into grassland and or arable land, which is essentially agroforestry or orchards, which means only half half of the land in that in that nature-based solution is lost to agriculture. Um, but it also provides less benefit than a whole woodland does. Then there's shared bird planting and hedge planting. Um, then there is the sort of habitat measures, creation of species rich grassland, restoration of species rich grassland, biodiversity ponds and margins. Um, 
those are more on the side of the um, habitat and biodiversity benefits. They provide some flood risk benefit and some carbon benefit, but not as much as some of the other measures. Um, the next grouping then is soil improvements and agricultural land management. So the first two, slitting and subsoiling, is essentially improving soil structure in agricultural soils to improve the infiltration and reduce runoff. So those don't have any impact on, well, they don't reduce any agricultural output. In fact, they might increase it because improved soil structure also helps um, with crop yield. Um, and they provide a lot of flood risk reduction, especially because this is something that can be quite easily done across a large area in the catchment. And the soil is the biggest store of water in the catchment. Um, then there's arable reversion, but also um, including more diverse swards um, within agriculture, which provides um, flood risk benefit, carbon benefit, and also biodiversity benefit, although obviously less than if they were um, natural habitats rather than cultivars. Um, and there's continuous vegetation cover doesn't impact on agriculture but provides benefits and then the last group is the sort of measures that are more looking at flood risk reduction which is um, a floodplain reconnection or creating ponds on the floodplain to hold back some water um, restoring meadows on the floodplain that can be flooded during wet weather um, leaky woody dams um, runoff ponds um, Buns is basically yeah building a, a bank where um, water is usually flowing, which is either runoff or on the floodplain, so that that water is temporarily held back. Swales are basically a sort of digging a, a, a depressed area, either where water aggregates or on the floodplain to again temporarily hold water back. And remeandering is. Um, well, re-meandering a stream that on historic maps was meandery, but then has been straightened since. And that's basically putting meanders back in to slow the flow, but it also does create some habitat. So I should have put a tick in there. And wet woodland and stage zero is a relatively new river restoration technique, um, which basically is looking at um, restoring, well, it's, basically flattening a section of river that has become incised or is unnatural and letting, well, flattening it out and then planting wet woodland or dropping leaky dams in there and then letting the water flow through it and carve its own riverbed that it naturally wants to have, which obviously takes out 100% of agricultural production because it's the sort of least managed of all of the nature-based solution because it's basically doing something and then completely stepping away and letting nature do what it wants to do, which can be quite a scary thing to let someone allow to do on your land if you still want to use it. Okay, so that was the initial setup. And then we are engaging with you guys um, to find out what sort of nature-based solutions you could be willing to carry out on the land. Obviously, that is based on whether the payment rates for those would be right and whether the sort of governance structure of a scheme would be right. But it's sort of, because those things are so interlinked, we have to look at them in two separate categories and just assume that the payment rates are right for you to work out what you would like to do and then look at the payment rates, assuming that you do want to carry out those measures. So then we have done um, baseline mapping to essentially identify the best places based on the evidence we have, like modeling or existing habitat maps, ex existing carbon work in the catchment essentially find the best places, the most effective places to carry out a certain nature-based solution. So 
for farmers, it's usually easier to work something like this in an opportunistic way, because you might already have ideas of where you want to carry out certain actions, or maybe not that, but maybe you know which part of your land is the least productive and therefore which you would be most happy to give up. Um, which is a really sensible approach to start looking at opportunities, but we also need to be evidence driven and look at the evidence and then sort of marry up those two, you know, the where you are coming from and where um, science is coming from, but also where buyers are coming from. Obviously, they want to pay for things that are done in the best possible places. So to establish a baseline, we have looked at all sorts of different mapping. This mapping um, is showing flood risk on a example farm in the catchment. You can see the farm boundary as these, these green lines here. And the farm has got some um, streams that have some flood risk um, on the land. But also you can see that downstream, you know, what happens on this land affects what the flood risk is downstream. <clears throat> we have modeled some flow pathways, which essentially is telling the computer to take the topography of the land and say, OK, if all of that water was going to run off the land and not get infiltrated into the soil, where would it run? And that shows these um, red lines, some of them are dotted, um, which means they are less likely, and some of them are proper lines, which means they are more likely or potentially are already small streams. So that can then quickly give us an idea of where water would be flowing in the landscape, and therefore, you know, it's best to put intervention in the places um, to basically disrupt or slow down this flow which is what we then have mapped and is also part of the hydrological model that was done. So basically on this farm, a lot of the area, which before we have seen had a lot of the flow pathways on it, is put down as an opportunity for soil improvement. And along watercourses, um, they have put opportunity for riparian woodland planting. There's also opportunity for wider catchment woodland, um, which links to where flow can be slowed, but it's also looking at where that can be connected with other woodland um, from a habitat point of view. And then it does, it does model all sorts of other things like leaky barriers, but on this farm it didn't, plus it is too small at that scale to see. But this is basically mapping that has been produced for each of your farms and we will send that out to you for you to have a look at and see just out of interest you know what has the model produced but then also to take that a step further and say actually I'm not interested in that but yeah I would consider this if the payment was right and take it from there so this is another um baseline map um this one is looking at habitats that are currently existing in the area. So basically, if you wanted to trade any nature or biodiversity credits through biodiversity net gain, all the habitat on a farm needs to be classified under the UK habitat classification, which then gets put into you know grassland, woodland, dense scrub, purple moorgrass, all the different habitat types. And those habitats then get given a um, habitat health score. Um, and then obviously the plan is with that, you would get um, paid for a credit of improving that. So therefore it's important to have the baseline right. So what we have done for the habitat baseline is looked at um, RPA land use codes and translated those into habitat classification. But because we couldn't go and survey each field, we have assumed them all to have a you know habitat health of medium quality, which is obviously something that would need a bit further um, surveying at a later stage, if and when we are ready to start trading 
that's then when we would have to do um, condition assessments to drill a bit more into detail. But this is giving us a good um, overview of what we have on the participating farms already. So that then gets turned into um, opportunities. Um, basically, the darker, the more opportunity, which also looks at, you know, what, what is it connecting to? Okay, so we have created those opportunity maps for all participating farms already. And we have then translated what the maps show into actual figures. So we'll be sending you what we call a farm investment plan, showing the maps and then essentially tables that say, okay, the map is saying you could, um, you could do 20 hectares of soil improvements um, and those soil improvements could achieve this much carbon storage, this much biodiversity um, gain, and this much flood risk reduction. So you can imagine how much work has gone into estimating what can be achieved, because all of that is basically still science and development. So for some of it, we could use existing codes that already there so biodiversity net gain already has made those calculations and has done the research um, to base their calculations on so we could use them there but for others um, we have had to sort of read in scientific papers and look at example case studies and see where we can take information from to derive some indicative um, nature benefit delivery that could be achieved. So for this part of the project, we then need some of your input. So basically we will be asking you which of those suitable nature-based solutions that we have mapped for you, um, would you want to carry out with the assumption that payments were right? Um, so that's basically the first question is, which of the solutions are you interested in? And then how much of them could you do? So let's say we have mapped that you could do 20 hectares of soil improvements. You could say, okay, as part of soil improvements, there is um, herbalase, there is slitting, um, there is cover crops, but I would be willing to do five hectares of cover crops and subsoiling on 15. So that information we would then use um, to sort of, well, A, calculate together how much the participating farms in this project would potentially want to carry out, but also we can extrapolate that and scale that up across the whole catchment to sort of have something to say, well, farmers in the catchment might want to deliver all of this. Network Rail, are you interested? Here is our, you know, our sales pitch, essentially. And the issue with a lot of these things, especially flood risk, is that only a lot of interventions across a large scale will achieve the benefit. So we have to, you know, have a sales pitch saying we will want to do a lot of these. Um, which would have this effect for you, for them to want to pay for it, because a few individual leaky dams here and there isn't actually going to achieve that 15% reduction in flood risk that they are looking for. Okay, then the next stage is, um, I've kind of already said it, that Terranomics will take those figures and start talking to Network Rail you know, does this idea have any legs? Farmers would be willing to do this much. Would you be willing to pay for that? We'll get back to you once we have more idea of how much that could cost. And so then that next step is exactly working out with you guys, how much would you need to be paid? And therefore, how much would it cost? The likes of network rail, how much could be achieved through existing funding? So, 
basically what we will have worked out is the cost for each nature-based solution that we are suggesting for you. So we will have split it into the capital establishment cost, the ongoing maintenance cost, and that's per year, and then income foregone, so loss of agricultural income on that hectareage or meters or whatever you are doing. So those are, you know, again, you can imagine how difficult it is to work these things out. Um, we have used available information like the John Nix handbook, the, you know, the most up-to-date one, although we all know that these costs change by the day with inflation. So, you know, there's always an element for error, but we have done our best if we can do. And if you spot any mistakes or something doesn't seem right, please flag it up um, and make a suggestion of, you know, what you think the real cost is so that we can improve on what we have done. We've also used, for income foregone, we've used some figures that the government is using for the schemes at the moment. So usually they are only paying for income foregone. So we could we could use some of those figures. And we've used figures from projects that we have carried out at Quag. So across the region, we've done a lot of natural flood management projects where we have had funding and then paid the farmer or contractors to carry out certain things like leaky dams or floodplain connection. So we have got 10 years of data to say this sort of scheme usually costs this much. And then we've tried to work out what the available funding is at the moment. And obviously into that, we have had to put an element of, you know, some, some of this available funding can be stacked with a credit and some of it can't. So we have tried to work that in. So we've looked at available funding through countryside stewardship and the sustainable farming incentive. But also we've shown, you know, this sort of measure, let's say, um, restoring a floodplain meadow, which is moving a habitat from intensive grassland to species rich grassland, you could get that many credits through biodiversity net gain. But then the, the money that that would generate is up to biodiversity net gain. So we've had to make assumptions for that. So the question to you then, once you have seen what we have calculated is, you know, firstly, if you spot any mistakes, please let us know. But also, what would you need to be paid on top of, you know, how much it would cost um, in order to be incentivized to do it? So what goes beyond cost recovery? And in the first meeting that we had, that was basically the main feedback we had from farmers that they said, well, we basically would be willing to potentially do quite a bit, but we need it does need to generate an income for us rather than just um, cost recovery. So yeah, the credit funding needed then essentially is cost recovery and the incentive minus what funding we can get from pots already. So this is what we would then take to Network Rail or other investors as what we're asking them to pay for. Um, yeah, so Terranomics would, we are gathering all of the information from you on that and Terranomics would then take that to the investors. And then the next step is also to work out, well, how could we make it work in terms of the governance structure? Um, so all the red is basically questions that we will ask you. I have showed you the model that they used in the Y catchment with forming an intermediary organization that aggregates and basically administers and negotiates. Um, so that's something that we would have to look into. But firstly, um, on a sort of farm level, what, what payment structure would you be after in order to be incentivized to take part? So that's the frequency and the weighting of payments. So is that quarterly payments or is it annual payments? And do you need the capital cost upfront or can, you, can that get paid once you can provide evidence that it is done? those sorts of questions. 
would you want to carry out the work yourself or um, organize a contractor yourself or get a potential marketplace to administer all of these schemes together and organize the delivery? So that's, again, based on feedback from the first workshop where farmers have said, well, some of these we'd probably want to carry out ourselves where it is very close to our agricultural operations, but others, you know, not only does it cost us to do it, but it also takes a lot of our time, which we don't have. So therefore, for some measures, it might make sense if a third party organization could say, okay, this is how much woodland planting we're going to do in this catchment. We get one contractor to do it, which will also save us money overall. Um, but obviously, to for them to be able to do that, you kind of have to give up some control of your land because someone else is just letting you know when a contractor comes or you don't have that much decision-making power over who the, that contractor is. So that's basically why we're asking and which measures that would apply to and which one it wouldn't. Another question is, would you prefer to have payments based on um, based on nature based yeah based on the solution the the measure that you're carrying out or based on the outcome so in the last workshop we've had farmers say well we kind of want to be paid for what we do because that makes a lot more sense i put in a woodland i get paid for the woodland whereas buyers or investors of these schemes want to pay by outcome because they are not buying a woodland they don't necessarily care about what it is, but they care about it's saving this much carbon or it's generating this much biodiversity. Um, so this is something that could potentially cause quite a bit of friction in how we match those two things up. It could be that, you know, it has to be either or, or it could be something that that intermediary translates the payments for individual action into credits. But that's you know, questions for you guys to have a think about and let us know what you think. Then another area to explore is how this aggregation could um, work. So at the moment, we're calling it a potential calm marketplace. Um, you know, would you even want to take part in a collaborative group where, you know, you have to give up some um, control over your land potentially for someone else to manage or you know are you not interested in collaborating or is that something you'd want to do who would be the most suitable to set up and administer this calm marketplace you know is that an existing organization let's say the a and b or would that be a subgroup of farmers um and then the next question is you know how would that marketplace be funded so obviously, some of the income that you would get from carrying out actions would have to go into funding that marketplace to exist in the first place. And then some of that money is usually needing to be paid up front for people who work for this organization to work there and do the upfront negotiations. Um, then there's questions around verification. So, you know, who should be responsible for carrying out verification, which is basically checking whether A, you have done what you said you would, and B, whether that actually provides the benefits that the buyer is paying for. Um, and then the last um, issue is around contracts, you know, what sort of time scale would be acceptable for contracts. Usually farmers prefer short-term contracts, but obviously everything to do with nature, especially carbon and flooding quite often is quite long-term. Um, so biodiversity net gain is usually around 30 years contracts. Um, so where we could be using regulated schemes that are out already, we'd obviously have to use the contracts that they are using but where we're setting up something with Network Rail, the council, whoever, we could try and negotiate contract durations that work for everyone. Um, so just some examples of um, 
groups of farmers that have um, come together and are delivering nature credits schemes that are working. So one of them is the Environmental Farmers Group in Dorset and across several different catchments. So the way they are doing is, is that each farmer has to pay £1.25 per hectare subscription fee to be part of the group. And that money then pays for the administration and negotiation of those schemes. And obviously they are benefiting from paying someone to you know, have better income from those schemes than they otherwise would if they were on their own. But also the person who's negotiating and looking into it can stay up to date with these credits and basically advise the member farmers in return on what the you know the best action is and how it could be done and then there's another example which is called the green farm collective so again that's sort of based on annual subscription model so here it's 250 pound per year per farm um and they've set up a, a trading platform and a sort of monitoring platform is all done via an app and that um, you know, does the calculations which we have sort of started doing for this. Um, and then for both groups, this intermediary, you know, farmers group or collective also gets a, a percentage of all of the credits negotiated as a way of income and funding the sort of ongoing management of the group. Yeah, so I've sort of talked you through a lot of individual aspects of nature credit schemes and what needs to be done to set them up. Um, and once we have worked all of this out, it would then be, you know, again, going back to investors, everyone else getting back together and seeing could this actually get done. So just to get a bit more realistic with the next steps for us and for you. So by mid-April, FWAG um, will send out these farm investment plans, which essentially have the um, baseline and opportunity maps. And then we'll show you the cost and benefit calculations for you know outcomes for nature, but also how much that is likely to cost you. Um, and we'll also, with that, send out a survey to gather your feedback. So all these questions I talked through will be part of that feedback so that you can all have time individually to, you know, make it bespoke to what um, measures were shown on your land to be suitable and what you want to do and give you a bit more time to think how it could work on your farm. Um, another reason why we've decided to use a survey rather than have it as an event is usually at events there's a few very outspoken people and I'm sure a lot of other people have opinions and something to say but it's not in their personality necessarily to add their voice in a large group so this way you know we get we get an even spread of information coming from everyone who is involved and willing to fill in the survey. Um, then by the end of April, or potentially we'll give you a bit more time, we haven't quite decided yet, um, we would hope um, that you return the survey to us. Um, so that's all these questions of, you know, how could it work? What would you like to deliver? Um, what would you need to be paid? How can you see it work? Um, and then mid-May, we will take what you said you would potentially deliver if the payments were right and add all of those up and scale it up by the catchment and calculate how much funding would be needed, which we then give to Terranomics to talk to buyers. And then by June or end of June, we are looking at doing a wrap-up event where we can show you how far we got along this sort of snake diagram that I used today to show you what the individual steps are. So hopefully by then we'll have indication from buyers whether they're interested 
and indication from you how much you would be interested in delivering and whether you know this idea has legs and if it does what the next steps are um, for all of us to make it work if we want to. So yeah, this was a very, very quick run through. Um, are there any questions for now? And also, thank you very, very much for your input. As you've seen throughout this presentation, this we are working on this because it's a contract, but basically without your input and you wanting to be part of it and wanting to deliver it, it could never work. So therefore, we have to get your input to set it up in a way that would work for you, because otherwise there's no point in setting up in the first place because no one would want to take part. Um, so hopefully this has also shown you how much um, power essentially you have um, in this whole conversation because more and more organizations will want you to um, deliver more and more and more. And, whilst that can feel kind of a bit like them and us and they're blaming us and they want us to do all of this stuff, you know, this is your opportunity to add your voice and say, yes, it's great actually that we can be part of the solution, but in order for us to deliver that and give up, you know, what we want to do with our land, um, we will need to be paid this and that is the only way that it can work. So yeah, thanks very much. And are there any questions from the one person who's here? <laughs> um, or yeah, if anyone who is who is watching this back in their own time, if you have any questions, um, give me a call. My number will be in the email that I send this recording out to you with. So I I do actually have a question. Yes, please. Um, if somebody upstream from me does something on the land because they've entered into this scheme mm -hmm. but I hadn't I mean I, I can't see anything that I could really do um, because uh, the land is quite um, I would imagine quite carbon neutral and quite environmental already that that, um, that I'm lucky enough to have um, but what if somebody upstream is doing something um, that has an effect that rolls out onto my land because of what they're doing how how you know how, you know do i have any say in that are you worried about a positive effect or a negative effect um so uh, i would say a negative effect i mean ultimately yes because mm -hmm. i'm into the wildlife but you know if they're gonna say flood a certain area of their land and then it floods a bit of um land that i've got um where i don't want it to flood how do I? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's where it, it can get quite tricky. Um, usually, most of the, the flooding um, solutions are sort of, they will stay on the land. But where, you know, like planting a woodland, for example, shouldn't have a, an effect on you of anything. Hopefully it links up with some of your woodlands. Um, but where there is schemes like, you know, lowering the um, river banks and flooding the floodplain that obviously can only work if all of the people who would flood would be into it and would want to receive the payments so as soon as one person says yeah but I'm in the middle and I don't want this then obviously the the two landowners around wouldn't have a chance in doing it right but usually those things are quite small even if it's like a pond, quite often, I mean, we have included measures like this wet woodland and stage zero, which, you know, is the most effective and biggest thing that can be done. But let's face it, in the UK, these things, we have tried several times to deliver things like that. And it's only ever been delivered on, let's say, National Trust land, because that's one landowner. Right. Because it is very difficult to do across several land holdings. So I think realistically, it's mainly going to be smaller interventions that are a bit more engineered, I'd say, in the sense that, you know, there's an 
in high flows, there's an, an inflow into a pond on the flat plain and then an outflow. And therefore, we know it's not just flooding the whole flood plain mm. unless all landowners are happy to do that, which is unlikely unless, you know, obviously the payment rates are really lucrative, let's say. Mm. But but if if you know I wasn't in part of the scheme, then yeah. I wouldn't get any of the payments anyway, even though it might have a knock on effect. Yeah. But then they couldn't. Other landowners couldn't put something in place that would have an effect on adjacent land without having the permission to do that. Yeah. And and another concern I have, I can hear how the railway line wants to invest because it's affecting their business. But is there any other, um, you know, if people are wanting to make money out of this and they're not got quite the um, the ethics, do we get to see who the investors or the buyers are? Um, yeah, I would imagine so, yeah. Right. Okay, thank you very much. That's... At the moment, it's mainly sort of Network Rail and the Council and some environment banks. But once it once something is set up, it might attract further investments. Mm. But I mean, I'm in, I'm as intrigued to see who it would attract as you, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, Sabine. Thank you. I hope this has been interesting. <laughs> it has cleared up some sort of mysteries of what nature credits are supposed to be doing. Mm. But yeah, we'll see if we can make something work. Thank you. Cool. I'll speak to you soon. Okie doke. See you soon.